Hello, everybody. Welcome to another week of Seeing Jesus More Clearly. My name is Dave Nolette. I'm so glad you decided to join us this week. Listen, we are in the middle of a series looking at verses in the Bible, common uh, scriptures in the Bible that we've looked at, we've interpreted over the years. And in interpreting these scriptures, I believe we've, we've come to a wrong picture um, and a wrong conclusion of who Jesus is. You know, uh, so many times we've, we've read the Bible and we've read sort of this dualistic nature to God where we ascribe, uh, you know, different thoughts and intents and things to God that don't line up with the God that we see revealed in Jesus, that don't line up with the trajectory of character that we discover in God throughout the Old Testament, um, you know, and, and really this this dualistic thinking is dangerous for us as believers. We've got to be able to, to look at the scripture to identify, to recognize when we see something that's truly an example, uh, a representation of, of God and the character of God and uh, all of this. And, and when we see something that's, that's either become twisted uh, by our perceptions or something else along the way. And in that vein, I want to take a look here over over the next couple of weeks at the book of Revelation. You say the book of Revelation, yeah. You know the book of Revelation. This is uh, largely considered by many to be one of the scariest books in the Bible. I know uh, a number of a number of Christians over the years have argued for it to be, you know, not included in the biblical canon and uh, things like that. Martin Luther actually famously argued for it to be uh, stripped out, you know, after he nailed his uh, 95 theses there on the on the door and, um, you know, proclaimed that the just shall be saved by faith, um, you know, in addition to some of the other problematic things that he did. Um, but he, uh, you know, he, he famously argued that it, it bore no place in, in Scripture, partially because the Jesus... Uh, that's that's often been interpreted in the book of Revelation feels so different from who we see and who we know in the rest of Scripture. You know, uh, growing up in the church, I don't know about you, I grew up... Um, you know, coming up of age in the 90s and the 2000s there. Uh, and the, the book of Revelation was really... Um, it was taught really from a place of fear for a lot of people. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times growing up in church, I came down, you know, the stairs and people were gone or I came home from school and nobody was home and I expected somebody to be home. And I thought to myself, dear God, did I miss the rapture? Like, did, did I miss it this whole time? Like, you know, Lord, forgive me, you know, not Catholic, but I'm doing the sign of the cross and this whole thing, <laughs> you know, so, um, it, I, I don't think some of the people who taught it intended it to be taught that way, uh, but it really came across in a place that led me to be full of fear about about it and things like that. And you know, uh, A Thief in the Night was one of those you know popular movies in the '70s, and I, I haven't seen it. I've only heard reference made to it. But what you know started coming out when I was growing up was the Left Behind series, right? You know, um, the the Left Behind series, this whole fictional version of of what could happen. You know, were were Jesus to come back? People People be left behind, the rapture, uh, all of that. And it, all of these things, um, you know, there's there's a bunch of prophecies, series, um, things we've been taught in church and Jesus coming back, the final battle of Armageddon and, you know, all these different things. And it's it's been taught to us that Jesus has laid aside his peacekeeping ways and he's ready to, to wage war on humanity, wage war on those who would dare to oppose Jesus. Um, you know, and... As we've been talking about over the last few weeks, Jesus doesn't change, right? God doesn't change. This the, the the character of God is the character of God is the character of God, right? This is this is uh, not something that's uh, you know something that we can change lightly. Um, so I, I really think that you know number one, our view here on the Book of Revelation deserves some questioning. If it presents to us a picture of Jesus that does not look like the Jesus we see in the Gospels, we ought to question it. We would do well to question it. In fact, um, you know, not only this, but th this modern view of the rapture of, you know, premillennialism and, uh, you know, Jesus is gonna, Jesus is gonna take all, all of the church, the true church, the believing church into heaven. Everybody else is going to be left behind kind of a screw you hope you can figure it out. This is your last ditch effort to be saved before, uh, you know, you get thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity. Uh, th this really wasn't a view that existed prior to 1827, a man by the name of John Nelson Darby, uh, is is widely credited with popularizing this view, coming up with it, preaching it, teaching it, sharing it. Uh, but it's not something that we find largely held to by 
those in the early church. It's not something we find that uh, people back then really lent a, a great deal of of credence to, you know, you go back even 500 years and people weren't holding to this belief. So it's, it's a relatively new belief. And as we've, as we've made mention of before, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's an incorrect belief, but we should approach with caution. You know, we, we want to make sure that we're not just coming up with something that somebody, in, you know, invented on a whim and uh, we, we we're just ready to go with this idea, you know, and this isn't really even the widespread view in the majority of the church today. It's largely just uh, the not, you know, you've got the Eastern Orthodox, the, the Catholics, all of them. Uh, a lot of them don't hold to this kind of belief system. And then you've got you know, everybody who's a, who's a Protestant, and not all of them hold to this belief system. You've really got to get into, like, a lot of the Baptists and the Pentecostals and, uh, you know, things like that where, where it gets in there. So you've got, like, a section of a section of a section that believes this is really the way that it is. Um, and this is, that's just talking about, you know, the prophetic parts there in Revelation, um, you know, where, where John is writing um, arguably what, what scholars deem to be apocalyptic literature, uh, where we'll you know, I don't know if we'll get into that. I, I don't know if I'm, I, I don't think I'm qualified to speak on that. But I want to really talk about the beginning of the book of Revelation. You know, uh, the book of Revelation starts off with a series of letters to, to the, the seven churches, right? This is, this is uh, who Jesus appears to John and tells him to write to, to the seven churches, right? And he goes and he writes and he lists all these different things and to the angel of the church here, the angel of the church there, and, and so on and so forth. And we, we go through the scriptures and what's been taught a lot of times is that we've got this this sort of carrot and stick again. You know, we've talked about that before, right? The carrot and the stick approach, where he, here's the reward if you do good, but the punishment's coming. You know, I'm going to bring the hammer down if you do bad. Um, you know, you see things like you need to turn or, you know, be hot or cold, you know, don't be lukewarm or I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And, you know, Jesus is, Jesus is ready to go here. This is the warrior Jesus. He's, he's ready to set things right, to knock heads together. And we do well to take heed of this. But again, this is in direct contrast to the Jesus that we see in the Bible. Um, you know, we, we've presented to the world a double-minded Jesus, a double-minded Jesus. And really a double-minded Jesus if Jesus is double-minded, it's not Jesus. You know, it, this isn't the gospel of grace. This isn't the message of Jesus. This isn't really who he is and, and what, what Jesus taught you and I along the way. So I want to take, a, take a, you know, a few weeks here, and we're just going to go and you know, might read one, might read two of these letters here every, you know, every week, and we'll go through them and kind of take a look at them, and um, you know, we'll... we'll We'll see where we go, because I, I don't believe Jesus has changed. I believe uh, a far simpler solution is that we've read the letters wrong. And a quick note before we dive into this, um, a lot of this, this study uh, it was, was inspired by Paul Ellis's book, uh, Letters from Jesus. I'll have a link for it in the description of the video. Um, so you can go ahead and, and purchase that and support Paul's, uh, you know, Paul's ministry, Paul's work. Uh, he's, a, he's a doctor down in New Zealand. He's doing amazing work, got a wonderful blog, Escape to Reality. I've, I've referred to it numerous times. Um, you know, and Paul really does a, a, a great job of taking a look at the scriptures again, anew in light of Jesus to ensure that, that we're being consistent in how we look at the text. And like, you know, like everybody, I, I feel like I need to throw this disclaimer out there. I don't agree with everything he says, but I don't agree with everything that anyone says. Shoot. I mean, uh, you could pull up some of my old stuff and I'm sure that now I don't agree with it because we're growing, we're changing, we're learning more of who God is. Right. Um, and that doesn't make any one of us necessarily wrong. It just means we're, we're on a journey. We're on a path here. And so let's discuss it and let's grow together. So I, I I've got a link for you. If you want to go ahead and check out that book, you know, um, it's wonderful. Go ahead, give us a like. If you, if you're enjoying this video, you enjoy this kind of content and we'll jump in, uh, here in revelation chapter two. And I want to start off here uh, in Revelation 2 and verse 1. Uh, this, is, this is the letter here to the church at Ephesus. And so it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hands, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your endurance. Notice that. So he, he calls out three things. I know your works, right? Your toil and your endurance. 
I know you cannot tolerate evildoers. You've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. Verse 3, I also know that you're enduring and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. Verse 4, but I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you have at first. The, the King James and a number of other translations uh, say it this way, that you've left your first love. You've abandoned your first love. You've abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember then, verse 5, from where you've fallen, repent and do, whoops, do the works that you did at first. If not, I'll come to you. And I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I'll come to you. I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 7. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Now, <laughs> at first glance, you know, uh, this, is the, the, this is a challenging scripture, right? This is a challenging uh, verse, this passage for us to take a look at, but let's, let's break it down. You know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of value to be had in, in the discussion here of these verses, and I, I think when we break it down, you'll, you'll begin to see what Jesus is getting at through John. Uh, so we're finding Jesus in the book of Revelation here, looking at the letters to Ephesus. And so the first thing we need to answer is who is the angel, right? To the angel of the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus. Well, the angel simply is the pastor. Uh, the word angel, right? The word angel, it, it means messenger. So, you know, a lot of times we think of, you know, angels as, as a heavenly class of being, and they, and they certainly are. They're referred to as such in the Bible. Uh, but here, the way that this word is being used is it's simply referring to a messenger, to the messenger of the church in Ephesus, right? So, so we would term this person to be the pastor, right? The leader, the overseer, to the one who's in charge at the church of Ephesus. This is who I'm charging. You're, you're leading your flock. You're shepherding these sheep. This is the one to whom I'm writing to. The next question is, what are the lampstands, right? It says that, you know, he walks, Jesus is walking among the different lampstands, the seven lampstands. Uh, the seven lampstands represent the seven churches, right? This is, this is the seven churches in the book of Revelation that he's referring to. So we've got the messenger, the, the angel is the messenger or the pastor, um, the seven lampstands or the, second, the seven churches. But then notice this, that, that Jesus walks among them. I think that that's important to grasp that Jesus, Jesus is in the business of walking among his churches. Jesus is present in his churches. He, he walks among them. But now, now notice this. It says that Jesus sees their deeds, but he also saw their toil. He said, I see your deeds. I see the work that you're doing, and I see the heavy labor that you're doing. You've been hard at work. In this, and, and this word here is the word ido. It, it means to perceive and to know. And it's important to know that this verse, you know, a lot of times we think that, you know, Jesus is commending them for, for their work, um, you know, and, and he is mentioning that I see what you're doing to encourage them. But this, this word ido doesn't mean that Jesus is necessarily giving approval to the toil component, right? Jesus isn't necessarily speaking of approval. This word ido means to see and to perceive and to know. He says that I, I see. See you've been hard at work. I, I see you've been doing this. I'm encouraging you that you've, you know, you you've worked hard, but I, I'm making note of all this toil. I see this toil, and you've been toiling too hard. In fact, um, you know so much that we'll get to later on that that they they painted themselves into a corner. So um, it's not a verse of approval. It's just noting this has been seen. And they've endured, right? They, 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 they've endured the, the hardship, the stress, the strain that comes with toiling. You know, if you've ever uh, done any sort of hard work, any physical labor, you know what it means to toil. You know how difficult it can be to toil. It's not necessarily an easy thing to get out and to work and to, and to sweat. You know, we're, um, we're in, you know, the, the springtime, late spring early summer here in uh, Texas, and we're at that point now where it's getting hot. And I don't just mean hot, like I mean hot, hot. I told my mother-in-law when I moved down that uh, Texas has two, <laughs> two seasons, hot as hell and hotter than hell. Uh, I mean, we're, we're in hotter than hell, right? Uh, you know, so no, it's, um, 
Texas is hot. And so we're, we're at that point where it's hot, it's humid, it's, you know, uh, all these things like the air, you walk outside and you just feel like you could cut it with a knife and it's just like oppressive and it's on you. And, you know, uh, here, here at our house, like, like many other people, we've got a lawn, um, you know, people who live in a house and, uh, city lot, you know, all that good stuff. But that also means we need to take care of said lawn, right? So I, you know, I, I'm the primary lawn mower, uh, in the house. That's, that's, you know, one of my, one of my chores or responsibilities as it were. Um, and Shelby, you know, she, she was offering to help the other day. I'm like, no, this is, this is my thing. Like I can do it. Like I, I, I know you are totally capable, but, but let me handle this. <laughs> um, but you know, you go out there to do it and, and it's hot and it's sweaty and the sun's beating down on you. And, you know, so I, I got sunblock on, you know, protect, protect your skin, you know, and getting to the point where I'm, you know, mid thirties now. So I've got sunblock on the hands cause I don't want to have those like big gnarly liver spots on, um, you know, and uh, I got a big old floppy hat on, you know, guard, you know, protecting my neck and my ears and this bald head. Um, cause you know, the last thing you want is a big old brown spot up here. Right. But when you're out there and you're working and you're, you're, you're working hard in the lawn and you're, you're cranking that weed eater to get it going and, and going around and pushing that lawnmower and you're sweating and it, it's dusty and dirty and the grass is getting all kicked up and everything, that's toil. It's hard work. It's, it, it's difficult work. It's, it's, it's challenging work. You know, it's physically demanding going through and, and working on all those things. I'm the person too. Like I don't buy the... <laughs> This is something I learned from my dad, uh, whether it's right or wrong, you know, whatever. But uh, I, I don't buy the lawnmowers that have the little motorized component on them because that motorized part is like the part that tends to go out the soonest. <laughs> so uh, the, the push mower where it, it's got the little thing where you just kind of have to walk behind it. Um, that's great. But since that goes out the soonest, like I just, I don't buy that one because then you, you've got a big old like weight that you're carrying around with it when it goes out. So I just have the one that I got to push, um, which means I'm pushing <laughs> the entire time. Um, but you know, I digress. They, they've endured, they've worked hard. Right. So, so he goes into, you know, all these different things. There, there's, uh, the Laodiceans, they, they didn't tolerate evildoers. Um, you know, their, their endurance, the, there's some historical reference that the church in Ephesus was, was very diligent about being guarded against, you know, these wolves in sheep clothing that, that had come and, and tried to present themselves there to the church. They've endured, but there's something wrong. And, and what is that? This is that, this is what's wrong. It's they've left their first love. They've left their first love. And it's important to note that their first love is not their love for God, but it's God's love for them. They've stopped being in a place where they receive the love that God has for them. They're so concerned and so consumed with doing and doing and working and doing, and we've got to do everything right. And it's got to be perfect. And it's got to be, you know, all uh, it's got to be just right. They're so consumed with it that they've, they've distanced themselves from God's love. This reminds me of the story of Mary and Martha in the gospels. If you, if you recall, um, the story of Mary and Martha, you have two sisters there and, and Jesus comes and he's, he's at their house and he's, speaking there. And so Jesus shows up and he's talking and, you know, um, Mary, I believe is the one sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha's running around. I mean, she's, you know, she's making herself busy. She's, she's getting food, putting it in bowls and, you know, making all this, whatever, making all these plans and preparations. And her sister's just sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she finally comes in and storms in all huffy and, you know, Jesus, won't you tell my sister to give me a hand? I've, I've been working. I've been slaving away. I've been, I, I've been, you know, busting my butt on this all day long, you know, and she's just been sitting here. Won't you tell her to help? And Jesus said that she's, you know, hold up. You're, you're doing all this work, but she's chosen the more needful thing. She's chosen the more beneficial act. The beneficial act is not in all the work and all the doing and all the effort. The, the beneficial thing is, being in my presence, receiving from me. And the, the Ephesians, they had moved out of the place of receiving from Jesus. They had been working, they had been doing all these things, and they, they were working for God without allowing that love of Jesus to wash over them. They weren't resting and receiving in the love. Um, they, they were working there to the point of distraction. And so he, he notes this, that if they continue on this path, their lampstand will be removed. Now, it's important to note that their lampstand will be removed, that the text here is literally just moved. We, we, we say removed in, in a lot of our translations, um, you know, a lot of our scriptures. We say that the lampstand will be removed, but 
the verses just say that it will be moved. We're, we're going to move it. Now, here's the, the, the thing that I saw reading uh, Dr. Ellis's book, uh, and he calls it out here. You know, if you're in a place of exhaustion, if you're in a place of, of working yourself to death, working yourself to the bone, you know, trying to do good for God, if you're in a place that you've done all this work and done all this effort and y- you're, you're strung out, you don't know where to go, how is being moved a bad thing? How is it a bad thing? For God to move you. It's not to be negative. If they're working to the point of exhaustion, being moved out of that place of exhaustion is a good thing. I'll, I'll go here with this quote from Dr. Ellis uh, from his book. He says this, picture a loving husband whose wife is buried with work. Miserable, exhausted, and close to burnout. She tells herself, I'm doing this for us, but there is no us. Not when she's working 100 hours a week and sleeping at the office. Her husband misses her terribly, and he's concerned for her health. He reminds her of the simpler times they enjoyed at the beginning and hopes she will return to him. But if she doesn't, he plans to come to her workplace, sweep her off her feet, and take her away. He'll sell the house and move to another town if he has to. He'll gladly give up everything for her. He, he, he'll come to her workplace, right? He'll come to her workplace and sweep her off her feet and take her away. She'll be moved. We're going to move. We're going to get out of this place of exhaustion. You know, Shelby and I have had numerous seasons in our life where we've, we've gone and we've, we, we've been just busy. And finally, we look at each other and I say, I just need to get away with you. We need to move. We need to get out of this place. I just need to, I, I, I need just a, a day of just us, of nothing else. Because I haven't had time to enjoy your presence. And that's what Jesus is telling the church at Ephesians. Enjoy my presence. Enjoy who I am. Allow that to be the driving force in your life. Not your works, not your efforts, not everything you've done. Let my presence be what you're after. This is the message of Jesus to the Ephesian church. Come, get away with me. Remember what he said in the book of Matthew, the, the message paraphrase, I believe, says it like this. It's, you know, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come with me, get away with me, and I'll teach you to recover your life. That's what he's telling the Ephesian church. I tried to teach you how to recover your life. I tried to teach you how to, how, how to know what a true rest is, but you decided that instead of a true rest, you'd rather just, you know, walk away from it completely. You'd rather just keep working yourself to the bone, you know, keep working yourself to the point of exhaustion. And he says, this is not the way to live. And if you keep working yourself to this point, I love you so much. I'm going to come and I'm going to take you out of this. I'm going to take you away. I'm going to take you out of all the work so you get to a point where we can just rest and be together. This is exactly what he's wanting to do. This is not a threat from Jesus. Rather, it's a promise. This isn't a threat from Jesus that, you know, watch out or else. It's a promise that, hey, I love you so much. My care for you is so great that if you can't stop working yourself to the bone, I'm going to come and, and make sure that you get away, that you get a rest, that you, that you come and stick with me, that you live your life with me. This is the promise to Jesus. It's that their first love desires them. You know, think of the story of the prodigal son. Um, you, you've got the, you know, the younger son who, who runs away from uh, home. He tells the father, you know, give me, give me my share of the inheritance. And the father divides it up and he goes and he's on his way and the younger son's off and he, you know, goes and lives his life, does whatever. He's in a foreign country. And, you know, finally when, you know, famine comes, the money's run out, he's, you know, he's not living life the way that he desires to live his life, right? Um, and, and so what does he do? He says, I'm going to come back home. I'm going to come back home to my father. I'm, I'm going to return to my first love. Notice that, that when he comes back, the father runs to meet him. This was antithetical to Jewish culture of the day. The father didn't run to meet anybody. But this father was so overwhelmed with love for his son that when his son came back to the love of his family, father, it says he girded up his loins, I believe, and he, he ran. He, he's going and he's, you know, sandals and tunic and whatever flying everywhere. He's there because my son is back and ready for me to lavish love 
upon him. And this is the stance and the posture of Jesus towards the Ephesian church. This is the way that Jesus desires us to live. So Jesus isn't here bringing condemnation on air. His message is simply to abide in the love of God. This is the message of Jesus to abide in the love of God. And you know, um, when we find this, we find that in this letter to the Ephesian church, you know, this letter, it's, it's, not, about, uh, it's not about condemnation, right? It's not about condemnation, but rather, it, so no condemnation, right? This is it's not that. It's about come back to me. Come back to me. Stop being so busy. Get away from it all. You know, I, I think one of the, we'll, we'll close here, uh, but I, I think one of the dangers in, in so many churches these days, uh, I think one of the biggest dangers, the biggest pitfalls we see is we've got churches where it's all about this busyness. We've got a schedule and we've got to hit all these, you know, all these different things that are super planned out. And, you know, th those are all well and good, but we're doing all these things along the way rather than spending time with Jesus, engaging with the scripture, praying together. You know, there, there's a practice uh, known as co uh, contemplative prayer where we, we sit and we, we pray and we just, we rest, we listen. We let Jesus speak to us. This is what Jesus is calling the Ephesian church back to. And it's important to note that these letters, you know, these letters all came in the same, the same book, scroll, whatever you want to call it. They were passed along to all the churches. So all the churches, the seven churches, got to read these letters. These letters have wisdom for us today. And I'm telling you as the church, it's time for us to stop being so busy, to stop going after all these things at the expense of Jesus, to stop doing the works of God without letting God love us without realizing we're loved by God just the way we are. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter, you know, anything. God loves you just like you are. And rest in that. That's, that's my challenge to you this week is rest in the love of God. We'll pick up next week um, with, with the letter here to Smyrna and uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you then. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Listen, if you like this ministry, you like what you heard, you're, you're enjoying this, maybe you want to join the Grace Tribe, you can go to our website, bygraceinternational.com, and you can you can go ahead and click over there. And hey, maybe you've been watching for a while, you're tuning in every week, you're, you're enjoying this, this is ministering to you, it's, it's, it's stirring something on the inside of you, and you're saying to yourself, I want to partner with what you're doing, I want to be a part of this, I want to, I want to help you guys get the message out. You know, we would be so grateful. We do this, uh, we're a 501c3, do this, you know, we're not taking a salary here at this point in time, um, you know, all that. We do this just solely on the basis of, you know, this is what we, we feel we're supposed to do. And, you know, when you help give, support this, you help keep the lights on, you help us uh, go out and complete the mission we feel that God's laid on our hearts. And, you know, you can go ahead and do that as well on our website. Got a secure giving form there for you, bygraceinternational.com slash give. Links for you in the description below. And hey, maybe you're wondering what the heck are you doing here trying to go and do all this stuff with reinterpreting scripture? That's well, a good question, you know. Um, so I've got a video for you on that where we, we began to look at common misconceptions of God and of God's character and why we even feel like we're doing this at all. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and click right here.